right, and then I want to go to share screen. Share screen. Okay, I can go on this mode so you can actually see it. Okay, how's that look? Everyone can see that okay? Thumbs up. You guys have any questions from last lecture? I think just uh, kind of a bit of a recap here. We um, we dissected the uh, the body structure of an old Mercedes, and we went through and identified the different beams that make up the body structure, and um, we discussed the different loading conditions that were critical for a body structure. Question? Anyway, um, uh, and then we went through and we said, given these different loading conditions, um, what are the different uh, loading, or given these different loading conditions, what are the different, um, the different sort of global loading conditions, what are the local loading, uh, globing, uh, loading conditions on each of those different beams, depression, bending, torsion, and um, at these, I forgot to mention, the loading actually would probably be at these, these red lines, that's what those red lines are supposed to be, they're the cross section of interest. Um, and then we went through and we said, oh, gee, you know, there's some parts here that would make sense to make out of aluminum and some parts you could benefit from being steel and some parts you would really need to make them out of carbon fiber to absolutely uh, minimize the weight. Then we talked about um, battery day at Tesla and we talked about the, the rear kick up here and the way this casting was done. And, and can you guys remember what was the, what was the reason that I showed this to you? What was the, what was the questionable design design here that, that we should all notice. A, a crazy beam that they put in here that's not closed off. Right. Because the rail rail being bad in torsion. Exactly. But it wouldn't contribute very efficiently to, to the torsional rigidity of the body structure because the area that would conceptually be taking the most load had it been closed off had been removed. So all that load gets distributed elsewhere and it's more concentrated and therefore you need more material take care of it to handle that load and that drives weight. So it wasn't the most efficient design, but I'm sure there's a reason they did it. Okay, so um, any questions about this guys? I think um, uh, I think um, one of you, was it Wu, is going to um, show this as part of their student lecture or you did show this as part of your student lecture? Already have. About the, already had about the uh, using the battery pack as a structural member and using yes. the cells as, um, as structure to separate the two Shear panels, uh, upper and lower floor pan. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Nice, nice, uh, nice application of this uh, lightweighting technology. Okay. So, having said that, if you guys don't have any questions, I'm going to start here. Anyone? Okay. So, um, I'd like to um, introduce a, a professor named uh, Lucian Schmidt. Fortunately, he died back in 2018. He's no longer with us. And Lucian Schmidt is the I'd say pioneer, one of the great pioneers, or maybe the father of uh, structural, what he called structural th synthesis and structural optimization. And I'm going to get into what, what that means right now, but it has to do with optimizing the geometry of your beams and knowing the loading conditions and using numerical optimization to find the lightest design uh, solution. So um, Lucian Schmidt was a, a student at MIT. Um, in the 50s, um, 1945 to 1950. And um, after working, after going to school, he went to work at Grumman Aerospace. And I guess he didn't like that very much. So he was a professor at MIT from 53 to 58. Um, he was lured away by um, Case Institute of Technology, okay, which is in Ohio. And it's now called, um, someone help me out here. Kate, um, Case Institute of Technology merged with another university in the 60s or something. I can't remember the name of it, but um, anyway. Um, and then uh, he went to UCLA. He was there from 1970 to 1993. Um, interestingly, I was actually um, an undergraduate taking physics one summer. I think it was the summer of 92 at UCLA. And uh, it drives me bonkers that I didn't go seek this guy out and meet him because he, he apparently was very interesting. I could have learned a lot from him. Um, so I guess the moral to the story there is that um, while you're in a place like MIT, get to know your professors, even if they're not your direct professor, because you never know 
who might be there that um, was was very influential in a given field that you might be interested in, and the opportunity that you could have had to meet him and didn't because it was too late. You left or that person passed away. Um, and there's another point of uh, data there. I was um, I was a summer school, high school student at uh, Caltech in the um, late 80s. And uh, if I had been a little bit smarter, I probably could have met Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winner, an interesting person all, all together. Unfortunately, I screwed that up because I didn't know who he was, which was really stupid because a friend of mine was actually reading his book at the time and I didn't understand. Anyway, so try to, uh, try to meet your professors because you never know who's there and, and what interesting people you might meet. Professor uh, Schmidt was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 1985. And then I said, like I said, he died, he died just um, recently in 2018. Okay, so here is one of the um, a very interesting papers that Professor Schmidt published in 1981 called Structural Synthesis, It's Genesis and Development. And this is actually kind of a review article that he wrote that gives um, a, bunch of interesting, a bunch of interesting articles that he, sort of a review of a bunch of interesting articles he wrote on structural optimization. Um, at the time, um, when Professor Schmidt was, a, was there, he or was, was working on this, this topic. Computers were very, um, very feeble and didn't have a lot of power. And yet NASA, for example, needed, and the military needed a lot of help in reducing the weight of structures and maximizing the strength and stiffness. And um, so the, um, the professors and researchers at the time were very creative with, with mathematics and using all kinds of shortcuts to get to solutions. But um, rather than being able to just plug in um, something into a finite element analysis and then determine what the lightest solution was, they had to find a way to do it without finite element analysis because although there was finite element analysis back then, it wasn't necessarily that, that um, yeah, that powerful. But this example here I'm thinking actually as I'm talking here, is, this example is actually probably much older than I just made it out to be. This, this example was probably from the, from the 50s or 60s that I'm about to give you. And um, at that time, there probably would not have been a reasonable finite element code to, to do this problem effectively. So uh, here's how it goes by hand, but, but by doing it manually by hand rather than finite element analysis, I think you can learn a lot more about designing for lightweight. So um, here we have a column, a narrow column right here, of diameter D0, okay? And it is under pure buckling. So it's under this load P, so it's under compression, Okay, it has some length L and it has some cross section B, which is shown down here. And um, it has some wall thickness T. And the objective of this exercise is tr to try to minimize the weight of this structural member here in, in gray. The weight is, a, is an easy equation. It's given by this, this, this W value here. W equals the density times pi L D T. That's a, a reasonable estimate of the weight um, times L of, uh, of this structural member here in gray. Okay, nothing too magical there. Um, now I'm gonna tell you something that's very important and it's a theme you're gonna hear more about in the rest of this class and that's the concept of a design space, a design space. The design space in this problem is two dimensional. There's two different variables in the design that we can vary in order to minimize the weight. The thickness T of the wall and this value D which is given as an average of the inner and outer diameter of the, of the structural member. Now we can go ahead and um, plug in a range of values for T and for D, okay, within a certain set of constraints. So in this case, the diameter can't be larger than four inches and the wall thickness can't be smaller than 0 0.2 inches. And you can never have a D to T ratio of, of greater than 10. So we can very easily very easily begin plotting out the weight here uh, for different values of T and D, okay? The design space again is, is thickness and diameter. And we can start plotting out different, different weights as a function of T and D very easily here. Now, I want you guys to, I hope you can see this, this graph over here on my, uh, on my right, okay? Because um, uh, this, th there's a lot of little details in here and I'm gonna go through this as carefully as I can. And I, I'll apologize in advance here because normally um, if I were giving this lecture um, live, then I would redraw this on the board, which is what I've done in subsequent semesters. So you can see exactly how all this goes together. But um, so if we go ahead and we plot out different weights as a function of T and D, so that design space, we come up with these, these lines that I'm kind of tracing right now. 
a blue one, there's a purple one, I think that's a green one right there, okay? And these, these Ws, these are different weights for, um, in pounds for these different, these different members, okay? So downhill is towards the lower left, okay? Weight equals six, weight equals four, weight equals two and a half. There's probably some other weight equals one down here somewhere. So downhill, if you think of this as a, as a hill, a mountain, okay, the design space is some surface called a mountain. The top of the mountain within this, within this um, design space is over here somewhere, okay? And the bottom is down here somewhere. So weight is going downhill, okay? Um, there are certain constraints that we place on the design. Some of them, um, actually all of them I just mentioned. There's this, uh, a constraint here on the diameter of the tube. Okay, it's gotta be greater than, it can't, has to be less than four inches, sorry. We only have maybe a packaging space for four inches. And there's only so thin that the mill who's making the steel tube can go before the thing breaks, they can't make it. And then there's some ratio of, of B to T. That's also probably a manufacturing constraint. Again, this, this um, column is subject to some load P, so it's under, it's under buckling, okay? It will fail by buckling ultimately. If you keep pushing and pushing, it'll eventually fail under buckling. It will either buckle by a global mode, known as Euler buckling, or it'll fail by a local mode, okay, local buckling mode. The equations for those buckling modes are given by, um, by this function G, or actually G is, is the, um, taking the, the load that's in the um, structural member, subtracting out the critical load to get to, um, to, get to global uh, Euler buckling, okay? And then G is defined as the difference between the stress that's in there and, and, and the critical stress. Um, in order to make sure that you never get to the critical stress, uh, this, this, this subtraction, um, this difference has to be greater than zero. And we've done, a, we've done something similar here for, for local buckling, okay? For local buckling, the equation's given by this. So you've got some current stress in the, um, in the member, in the structural member that's a function of the geometry and the load, and you're subtracting out this critical stress for local buckling, and that has to be greater than zero. Okay, now it's very easy to go ahead and plot, to plot these two equations, G1 and G2, um, over um, over this design space. And that's given by this, this curve right here, G1, okay? And then this curve, um, red curve right here, G2, okay? And then we've, in order to um, represent the um, direction on which, in other words, which side of that line you can be on and still be within these constraints listed over here, we put these little shadow, or I put these little shadow marks in here. Okay, so you, you need to be on the other side of the line of those shadow marks. In the case of G1, you need to be on this side. On the case of G2, you need to be above that red line. Okay, and then um, I've also put in this constraint here, D, uh, for the diameter of the, uh, the, you know, the average diameter of the, uh, of the structural member. So you have to be to the, to the left of this. So your feasible region, your feasible region is defined by this sort of, I don't know, half parabola right here. Okay, so you have to, the design has to be somewhere in here in order to meet all these constraints. The um, constraints are often talked in terms of different types of constraints. So a side constraint is something that's very, you know, is, is, a, is a geometry related, it's just a number. Uh, and then there's behavioral constraints and that's like a stress in this case, buckling. Now, um, so we know that we need to be in this feasible region, okay, in order for the design to meet all the constraints. And um, we know that weight uh, is going downhill this direction towards the lower left, okay? Which means that the point um, of lowest weight for this design that'll meet all these constraints is where this green line intersects through the feasible region or goes right at the edge of the feasible region, which is the case here. So the latest, the latest design right here the latest design possible is this number one here. That is the, the local minimum, okay, within the feasible region. Okay, so um, this, is a, this is a nice, simple example of what we need to do a lot of 
in order to find the lightest design based on the geometry. We're not talking about materials anymore, we're just talking about geometry. But this is, this is a very simple example of something we're gonna do a lot of. And as we go through this lecture and subsequent, subsequent lectures, this gets scaled up into computer land where rather than having a two dimensional design space, you have a million by million by million by million by million by million, whatever design space. So um, uh, this, this is something that you can understand with your mind by looking at. The examples we'll get to later are impossible to understand as a human because it's just too big. Fortunately, the math is there in order to support it, um, to support the things that, that you and I can't imagine because we're just stupid humans. Um, but uh, we'll show later like how this gets ramped up, how this gets scaled up into something that really only a computer can address or understand. But uh, just to recap, um, you've got a two-dimensional design space, thickness and, and uh, 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 diameter, average diameter. Um, we plot out the weight on this graph, which gives us a, a sort of a, a response surface or a surface that we know we want to be at the bottom of or the, the minimum. We plot those out and then we start plotting the behavioral and the side constraints. And um, you can very rapidly or readily define a feasible design region. And then you know that your design has to be there. Then by comparing what's in your, what's in your design region with, um, with this uh, decreasing weight mountain, knowing that you need to be to the lower left as possible, um, you can find the lightest weight design and that's right here. Okay, this is, this is a key concept. And in order to understand what the computers are doing later, you need to understand this. So does anybody have any questions about this? Does any, everyone see this as pretty clear? Does this apply um, whether the structure is a tube or square or um, multi-sided or how do you differentiate the structural optimization um, diameter and, and so forth for various shapes? Right. So this is a very general concept. So no, it doesn't matter. These equations will change if it's a different shape member. But the, the concept, the method, the philosophy almost, <laughs> that, that all stays the same. So if this were square in diameter rather than round, this equation would change. This equation would change. Um, these constraints would look differently because it's no longer round. You know, maybe there's a thickness, sure. Maybe D is, a, you know, maybe D could still be four inches. Maybe that could stay the same. Maybe this um, D over T would have to change because of manufacturing reasons. But mainly these equations here would change. But the point is, is the, the method is still applicable. We could, you know, you could have a piece of bamboo in here and you could still write these equations. You could um, you could have a football in here and there'd still be some way to write out these equations that would, you, could, you could use. So this is a, a very general scalable method and you can use this method on darn near anything. And it doesn't even have to be weight. In fact, it's rarely weight. You could use this on maximizing profits of uh, your factory. You could use this on uh, methods like this, like the airline industry uses these, these optimization methods for scheduling flights and trying to maximize profit and minimize fuel usage and so forth. So, you know, you could be plotting fuel usage here, not, not weight. There's all kinds of things you can do. Um, it's, it's a very flexible method. Okay. Thanks. Oh, yep. You're welcome. Um, like I said, everyone, anyone feel free to ask questions at any time. Okay. So uh, here's, um, here's another example. This is the um, three beam truss example. Also another um, example from Lucian Schmidt. It was in that same paper, same review article he wrote in 1981. Okay, and um, this, this method was, or this, this problem actually, I don't know, was uh, I think it was something to do with something that NASA was building he did this for, but you have, you have three structural members, A1, A2, and A3. They're constrained at the top and constrained at the bottom at a common point. And then there's two different loading conditions. There's a P1 and a P2, and they're either um, applied um, separately or together. Doesn't matter, you can still do the problem either way. And uh, they're separated by 45 degrees from one another between A1 and A2 and, and A2 and A3. 
and the distance between these node points up here and down here is 10 inches. So um, let's, um, th this is the math on this, I guess is somewhat intractable. So um, in order to make things similar, simple, so we don't have to use a finite element code to do this, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna assume that the, the cross sections of A1 and A2 are, I'm sorry, A1 and A3 are the same. Okay, the um, object, so in this last example, um, this weight, we said minimize weight. We're gonna now introduce a new vocabulary term and that term is objective function. The objective function was to minimize weight, W. Okay, the objective function is this W function. We have a similar um, objective function here, W. Okay, the, um, the weight of this, of these structural members all together is given by this equation here, right? So um, we have said that the cross-section of A1 is a, and A3 is the same. Those two have the same cross-section. And now we can plot out this design space of A1 along the bottom and A2 along the vertical, right? And we can start plotting out weight. The way that Lucian did it in this case is that he normalized it by the density of the material and this distance N, which is 10 in this case. And you can start plotting out those lines. So here is um, this weight objective function equal to four, this normalized weight function equal to three, this weight, this normalized weight function um, equal to 2.64 right here. So these are the black lines, if you guys can see those, I hope. Okay, uphill is over here, downhill is down here. So as you go diagonally to the upper right, you're increasing in weight. As you go diagonally to the lower left, you're decreasing in weight. So since the objective is to minimize weight, you're trying to get down here somewhere. Um, we have a um, we have these constraints, okay, for the stress that is in these that's in these different members. Okay, you can if you if you um, you can figure out the stress on these um, on these um, structural members. Okay, I guess um, I said before that it was intractable. I was wrong. What, what I, but I guess I was mixing it up with is that a one equals a three to minimize to simplify the analysis, but you can, you can calculate the stress um, on these guys and um, given the loading condition of P1 or P2 uh, or both. And you can, um, you, you can say that the, um, the stress in these members has to be within some region, some range, so this thing doesn't break. So in, in, for whatever's in tensile here, given whether it's P1 or P2, the um, stress has to be less than 20,000 PSI. And for P1 or P2, which puts whichever member in compression, the stress has to be greater than 15,000, negative 15,000 PSI. So compressive stress, 15,000 PSI, right? Um, the stress in the I comma J member, where I is the, is which member it is, so one, two, or three, and J is the loading condition, so P1 or P2, um, is given um, by this, by the, the sigma ij, okay, and then the, um, the the constraints that we have for loading, we're going to use that same method that we used in this example, where we we take the difference between the maximum stress and the stress in that member given the loading condition, and we have to say that that is greater than zero. Okay, so that's how you that's how you um, make sure that you don't go over your stress constraint. Is you draw this, you write up this difference between your maximum allowable stress and the stress in the member given the loading condition, the loading condition, or given the, given the stress from the loading condition. And again, that's, that's gonna change. The sigma's gonna change based on your selection of A2 and A1. So you, you have to choose an A2 and A1. So this, this sum here um, uh, doesn't go to, less than zero. So this has to be, this has to be greater than zero. Where my cursor go? This has to be greater than zero in order to stop from failing. Um, then there's this other constraint here, given the second loading condition. I'm sorry, given the second loading member too. Uh, similar condition right here. So you, you have 20,000 minus the stress in the member that has to be greater than zero in order to stop from blowing past the stress constraint. And then for, um, and the third one here, 
uh, for compression under the first loading condition where you have 15,000 uh, PSI is your maximum allowable stress and compression. So the sum of these, given that you know, one of them is gonna be negative because it's a compression, has to be greater than zero as well. So these are, the, these are the stress constraints, the behavior constraints that you have to meet in order to stop, the, stop this thing from failing. Okay, and then um, the stress is given by these equations here as a function of A1 and A2. And um, that's, that's the stress in each of the members. So you can go ahead and very easily, for example, plug these equations uh, into, um, sorry, into a Excel program or whatever, and you can calculate these stresses out for the first loading conditions. Now you can go ahead and plot out um, H1, H2, and H3 on the same design space graph of A1 and A2. The, um, the graph for the, uh, the first stress for H1, that, that first stress constraint or behavioral constraint is given by this blue line, okay? The, um, the stress for the second condition, or I'm sorry, the, the, the stress constraint for the second one, H2, is given by this red line right here, okay? And then the green line right here is the stress constraint for the third stress constraint, H3, okay? And we know that we have to be, um, this, so this is, this is where those stress constraints equal zero. So we know that we have to be this direction, uphill, okay, on the weight scale. We have to be over here, right, to meet the second constraint. We know for that the, for the, um, sorry, that's for the first constraint. For the first constraint, you have to be over here. For the second constraint, you need to be um, above this line. And for the third constraint, you need to be again to the to the right of this this green line here. So if you could, if I could trace here the sort of locus of, of constraints, it goes like this. So we're going to go H three. Got to be to the to the right of that. You got to be to the right and above of the blue line that's here. Okay. And then as it turns out, the red one doesn't really matter. In other words. In other words, you will, you will hit the constraints first for, for H1, I'm sorry, for H, sorry, H1, H1 and H3, all right? Does that make sense? This is a little more complicated example, okay? You're gonna be, this is the, this is the locus. This is the constraint lines that you need to be to, to the right of and, up and above, okay? You guys see that? Everyone shake their head, okay? If you are in this, so this is, that defines a feasible region, labeled here as feasible region, okay? And then um, you find the area, or you find the, the, the weight line within that feasible region that has the lowest value. And that turns out to be, turns out to be right here at, uh, at uh, the normalized weight being 2.64, right there, okay? You see that? Um, as it turns out, if you if you um, calculate out the stress in every member and see when it all fails, and then you just design to that variable, you actually end up at a higher weight, okay? Because you're a little bit above, you're a little bit to the right of this black line right here. You go over here, you're not. So the actual the actual lightest design is not when each of those members fails. So if I, if I go through and I take each of those stresses, okay, if I take each of those stresses and I calculate it based on the, the, the stress constraints, if I figure out for each of those members individually, what is the stress at which they're gonna fail at? And I design my structure to that, you will actually end up with a, um, a heavier solution than if you use this method, okay? Because some, there's some weight sharing, there's some stress sharing between the different members as you apply these loading conditions. So the, the, the least weight design is actually here and not over here. This, this point too, like I said, this is, this is if you went through and calculated the stress on each element and then figured out what each one would fail individually and then calculated the minimum, uh, the minimum cross section for each of those members, you would, you would end up over here. And that solution would actually be heavier than if, you, if some of those members are designed below that, that uh, individual failure criterion. Um, I keep losing my cursor here. So right here, okay. So this is this is a, this is an important point that the lightest design is actually not always so intuitive. Okay, see some shaking heads. That's good. 
All right. Sheng Hung, you understand all this? It's all good? Thumbs up? Okay, great. Okay, so we're going to start talking a little bit more about uh, numerical optimization, the theory of numerical optimization, because that becomes really the um, tool that helps us um, figure out the correct geometry. We just we just did uh, numerical optimization here and here. I didn't call it that, but that's really what we did. Okay. So the best explanation I've ever heard of, of numerical optimization goes as follows. Suppose you are a mountain climber and you need to get up a mountain, but you're blindfolded. So you can't really see where the top of the mountain is. Okay. Let's call the mountain some surface, call it F, you know, F is an objective function. Before we called it W for weight, we wanted to minimize, but let's just say that we, we want to maximize in this case. And we have this, this subjective function W. We want to maximize W when, when F, or F, I'm sorry, we want to maximize that. When F is the maximum value, okay, that is when you have reached the top of the mountain. So you have some, call it altimeter in your brain and it calculates F and you want F to be as large as possible. But your, your subject is some constraints. You've got um, these constraints G1 and H1. These could be, I don't know, for this case, you call them just like snow fencing, like you can't walk past the snow fencing, right? And you want to make it to the top of this mountain. So you, uh, you start off right here and you take a step, you pick some direction. You just, you pick some direction just randomly and you decide if that's making you feel like you're going up or not. So you start here at F1 and then you go to F2, okay? And then you say, do I feel like I've gone up or do I feel like I've gone down? And you have this altimeter in your head. It says, okay, you've gone up. So that must be a good direction, a good direction to start going in order to find the top of this mountain. And then you say, okay, I've, I found this direction. It feels like I'm going up in that direction. I'm gonna take another step in that direction. So you take another step and you feel like you went up again. You say, oh, that's a good direction. That must be, that must be the way up. Remember, I'm blindfolded, so I don't really know how to get to this top of the mountain, but, but I felt like I went up there. My brain says I went up. My, my, my you know, internal altimeter says I went up. That's a good direction. And then you go to take another step in that direction and you can't go because you hit this constraint. You hit this snow fencing H and you don't know what to do. So you choose another direction. You say, okay, well, I know the fence is in front of me, so I guess I'm just going to kind of kind of turn around and, and I can't go back where I came from. I can't go back where I came from, but I can choose some direction that, that's sort of in that kind of that general way and see if I start going up again. So you go here to D4. Okay, you say, oh, gee, that was good. I went up again. This must be the right direction. And then you do it again and you end up here at, at D5, um, FD5. And you go, oh, okay, um, that's good. I just went up again. And then you try to move forward again in that direction, but you can't because you hit constraint G1. You can't go that direction either. You switch direction again. You can't go back where you came from, but you can go in some direction that feels like it's up. You head in this direction. Okay, that step was good. That step was good. I hit H1 again, turn to a different direction, et cetera, so forth. You eventually, you end up at the top of this mountain through, through iteration, through trial and error. That's that worked. You got to where you wanted to go. And, and probably when you're at the top of this mountain, if you keep your blindfold on, you probably can start maybe walking in some other different direction on the top of this hill to see if you start going down again. So you do. You start going a little bit, a couple other directions, um, and you maybe you go to the backside of this mountain, and you go down a little bit, you go, okay, that can't be right. And you go a couple of different directions. You figure every direction you go, you feel like you're going down, so you must have already found the, the optimum or the maximum in this case. Okay, you went through 10 iterations to find the top, but you found the top. Pretty simple? Okay, this of course also works going down. If you have a, if you have a reasonably accurate altimeter and, you're, and your optimization or your objective function is to find the minimum, I like minimum weight, then this, this same approach would work going down, which is what we just did in these examples. Okay? So, um, I want to play a game with you guys. Um, I'm going to hit escape here so I can actually choose some stuff here. But um, we have a function that I've put together. I've made this function up just randomly. It's f, okay, 
is um, a function of x. x is a design vector, okay, a design vector. The design vector has two components to it, x1 and x2. And so I want to find the minimum of f of x, okay? But I don't know, I don't know what the values are because they're all covered up here in the design space, okay? And um, my design space is x1 and x2. So I can fiddle with x1 and I can fiddle with x2 and I can find out which combination of x1 and x2 minimizes this function f of x. Okay, so you guys are gonna tell me and I'm gonna delete one of these little blue boxes and we're gonna go through this exercise, okay? And we're gonna find the minimum within this design space of negative 0.1 to one for x1 and then negative 0.8 to 0.8 for x2. You guys are gonna help me find the minimum Okay, you're gonna help me find the minimum of this function. And all of you guys are gonna participate. So unmute, everyone unmute right now. Okay, Steve, did you already do this one? I can't remember. You're muted, you're muted, Steve. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't wanna cheat. Okay, you did, I think you did this last time with us. Okay, so. It's a great, I, you know, it's a great game though. Um, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna play this game and I want you guys to, I guys want you to really, think or really watch closely what happens. Watch closely what your classmates say. Watch, pay particular attention to your thoughts of doing this, okay? And everybody's gonna participate, so everybody on mute. Okay, everyone on mute, go ahead. Share on YouTube. Okay, okay, so somebody, let's pick an initial position to start at. Somebody blurt it out. I, I would start with um, x2 equals to zero and um, x1 being minus 0 0.1. So the okay, middle so, bottom. So you want to start, okay, so zero, I, zero is right yeah. about here. So you want x2 equal to zero and x1 equal to what? It's uh, the smallest possible, minus 0 0.1. So you want to start right here? Yeah. Okay. 5.1. So why did you why did you choose that point? So the first order effect is the to the power of four uh, of x1. So you would want to minimize x1. So looking at the terms independently, which is not the right thing to do, but the quickest thing to do. Okay. <laughs> that was very smart that you're the first yeah. person to do that. <laughs> I've taught this class like three times. That's not the minimum, but but that was very smart. Most students um, don't think that way. They didn't. That's a, it's a really good point because it, it is going to dominate because it's to the fourth power. Mm -hmm. okay, so what now? So then, off to the let's say the right. Okay. How far? On the bottom row. How far? Let's do it's just step one, one spot two. over. How much? Yeah, let's say a step of one. So you want to go sure here? It's going in the right direction. Yeah. That guy there? 4.93. So you went down. That's good. That's good. You headed in the right direction. What now? Do you keep going in that direction? Okay. You're, you're a blindfolded skier on a mountain. You know when you're going up, you know when you're going down, but all, and you know when you're going back and forth, but that's all you know. And you know you want to get to the top of the mountain, or in this case, the bottom of the mountain. What do you do? You can, you, you can be creative here. You can do whatever you want. I, I know from experience you're not actually at the minimum yet. I mean, with, with this information, I would just keep going because that's yeah. you know. to the right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there's the value. You've gone down again. So your direction was correct. What next? Do it again. Do it again. One Take step or one. Again. Yep. Went back up. Oh. 
turn back around. And then uh, you can't go down, so uh, I guess go up. Okay, so yeah. you want to go here? Make sure they... No, back uh, here. Step, then go up. Back to point two, and then up from there, just to make sure the initial assumption was correct, which it okay, definitely is. So you want to go here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. back up. Definitely bad. All right. We've got a, a local uh, minimum. I think you're right. So um, yeah. So that is the minimum. Okay. So um, think about what you just did, though. You you chose a point and a start point, right? And you you actually very wisely didn't didn't really choose it randomly. You you looked at this equation and you thought and you said, okay, I see that the x one's got to dominate because it's to the fourth power. Very smart. Very smart, very smart to think of that. And so you went to the minimum x1. That was a, that was a very wise thing to do. Um, and then you said, I have to choose a direction to look, and I have to choose a step length. So you did. Okay. In this case, you chose, you guys collectively chose going to the right, and you chose, uh, Nick chose a step length, a step length of one. And that worked. And then you did it again. And it went down and you did it again. It went back up. And then you said, okay, well, I don't really know if I'm at a local minimum or not, but let's just, let's just look around a little bit. And so we went up, we went to point two and we went up and we found uh, another, another point, which turned out to be higher, the direction you don't want to go. So you were able to, to surmise that you were at a local minimum, right? So, um, very, very wise. Okay. But, um, it's, um, if you, what, what usually happens here, what usually happens, and I'm not, I'm not being disparaging of anybody, but usually happens is this, the class tends to pick a point up here in the middle of the graph, middle of the, of the table here. And they tend to go back and forth up and down. And it, it takes a lot longer to get there. And I think, you know, the question is, is you have to ask yourself if you were a computer and you were just given this function, what math, what, what algorithm would I need to write? What, or what, uh, you know, how would, as a computer programmer, how would you program your computer in order to, to recognize what you just did by picking that X to the fourth term, X one to the fourth term, because, because it made it a lot faster, right? So like I said, I'm not being disparaging of, of previous classes, but I'm just saying that the amount of time it took to find that minimum was about 10 to 15 minutes longer than you guys just took to find it. This is the quickest I've ever found the minimum on this, on this example. And I've, I've shown this to like four classes now. So, so it was quick. You got there quick. You, you used your knowledge of this equation and math and you, you went down and, and that got you there a lot quicker. But if you were programming a computer algorithm, how would you, how would you embed that into the computer, computer algorithm? How, what would you write in order to, to flag really quickly to the computer that that was a direction to go. You guys may not know this, but there are actually people out there who spend their lives trying to build faster numerical optimization algorithms. That's what they do. That's, that's their biggest passion in life is writing fast algorithms for, for doing numerical optimization like this. Um, a, a Garrett Vanderplatz, who I will introduce to you in a subsequent lecture, is one of those guys. He spent his life um, writing algorithms for, for finding uh, the minimum or maximum of, of, a, of a design space. That's what he did. He, he's into numerical optimization. And he, he goes to conferences or conventions where he has races with other, other people to try to write these algorithms that find, find the space better. You know, Wu, you just, found, you just found a great way of doing that. You just found a great way of speeding up this process that the other classes have never done before. But the question, the question remains, how would you program a computer, which isn't as smart as you, to do the same thing? Think about that. You don't have to answer right now, but think about that for a while. Okay, so um, there's your answer. The minimum was at um, x, was at negative 0 0.1 um, and, uh, and 0 0.2, okay, down there. That was the minimum. Um, this is a, obviously a subsection 
uh, of a bigger surface or an infinite surface. Here's a, here's a larger snapshot of that surface uh, of x1 to, to minus 1 to 4, and then x2 to minus 2 to 2. And um, you are, this is what we just looked at was, this, was this, um, this black box right here. Looking at a little bit bigger, there is another minimum you could also find, for example, over here at um, 1 comma 1. OK. Um, so um, what's the math behind this? How do, you, how do you program a computer to do this? So computers are very good at running algorithms really quickly over and over again if you give it the right math. So um, how do you do that? And, and that's what we're going to talk about for probably a couple minutes of the rest of this lecture. I think I'm going to stop with this slide right here and um, save this, this exercise for next time because it's a little involved. And I want to make sure you understand it. But um, how do you do that? So we, so the the mathematic the the um, the math community who works on numerical optimization breaks these problems up into what they call unconstrained and constrained problems. Okay, we will always be looking at constrained problems because when you're designing a real piece of hardware, there's always some limitation on how wide a tube can be, or how thin the wall can be, or what material you can make it out of. There's always some constraints, so we always deal with constrained problems, but just to understand the mathematics here, I want to just point this out. So if you have some single dimension design space, you have one variable x, okay? And you have some objective function f, f of x. And you know f of x, you can, you can plot out this curve, okay? You can plot out this curve very easily as a function of x, and there you go. It looks something crazy like that. I just made this up. This may not even be real. And in order to find the minimum of this problem, the, the minimum within this, this design space shown right here by this length, right? It's very easy to go ahead and take the first derivative of f of x, okay? Set it equal to zero. That gives you some value for x. In this case, that would give you the values for a, b, and c. And then you can go ahead and take the second derivative and you want the second derivative to be greater than zero. So you know that the curve is concave up at that point. And that will tell you the minimum where, where the where at these three points, A, B, and C, the second derivative is greater than zero. Um, and that tells you that in this case, A is the minimum, right? So this is, this is very easy. This is, this is first year calculus. And you know, everybody in this room has had first year calculus and this is, this is something you've been taught before. I have a feeling that when you learn this in calculus class, maybe it wasn't really described in the context of uh, structural optimization, right? It's not a bad assumption. Um, so, you may be, it may have seemed very um, abstract for you at the time, but, but now looking at this, you can kind of see maybe there's an application here. This method of um, you know, taking the first derivative, setting it equal to zero, solving for the different x's that give you zero, and then taking the second derivative at each of those points that made the first derivative zero, uh, finding which one is concave up or concave down, you know, plus or minus or less than zero, minus, uh, less than zero or greater than zero. This, can, this method can be expanded to uh, a multi-dimensional hyperspace, infinite dimensions, and there is a mathematical tool to do this. It's a matrix approach called a Hessian matrix. Um, it's um, it's you know, pretty abstract math. It's hard to get your head around, um, but it's easily, well, it can be programmed to a computer and the computer can, rel can relatively easily deal with a Hessian. I don't know why they call it a Hessian. I thought that was always some kind of German soldier or something. I don't, I don't really know, but anyway, that's the name. Maybe there was a Mr. Hessian who figured this out. I don't know. Now, if you deal with a constrained problem, like on the, on the, uh, on the right here, things look a lot different. Suppose you have the same function f of x and you're looking over this same range of possible designs for x or, or variables for x, design space of x. Um, but you're constrained by x1 and x2. So all of a sudden, if you take the first derivative, you'll get this value for b. So you say, OK, that could be real if I don't know what this function looks like. And then you say, well, let's take the second derivative. And you end up getting 0 again, because it's flat there. You wouldn't know what to do. Or maybe it was very slightly uh, positive. And you figured, OK, that, that could be a minimum. But you don't really know, because you don't really know what this function looks like beforehand. So, so that doesn't really help you. It turns out that the real minimum is, is over here, right up against this G1 constraint right here. Okay, so the question is, is how do you find, how do you find this minimum? How do you find this minimum if you don't, 
if you if you're within these constraints within these constraints and just like you were flying blind up here you're flying blind down here how do you find that point and that's where that's where the the genius of numerical optimization comes in and there's a, many different tools that have been developed over many years of this of of, of research into um, numerical optimization the most common method used is called a, is called the gradient method and that's the method that I'm going to discuss the most uh, starting next lecture <laughs> uh, there's some um, kind of more novel uh, methods that have been developed in the past maybe 20 years called genetic search where you I'll explain what this is but you kind of um, do sort of a simulation on what um, you know sort of evolution what what happens to natural organisms particle swarm method is another one oops I missed the s there amazing that you don't catch over all these lectures. Okay, but um, this area over here, this right side, this is, this is where we are going to focus for the next couple lectures. Okay, at least the next, at least one more lecture. We're going to talk about this over here and how you find uh, a local minimum or maximum within a constrained function, constrained problem. So that's where we're going to stop for today, guys. All right, so now we're getting a little bit more, I think, uh, mathematically abstract, but I, you know, and it's really easy to, you know, for some people to get sort of irritated by abstractness, but I want you to keep your mind, keep your mind right here and right here, sorry, right here and here, okay, because it's really no different than, than this. It's really no different than this. All right. Okay. Any questions, guys? Thanks, Tom. You're welcome. Thank you. Good job, Jiwan. <laughs> what? What, Steve? <laughs> Jiwan solved it faster than anybody. Pretty good. Well okay. done. You this is, and this is a compliment. You think like a computer. <laughs> you went for the lowest value. You, you, you solved it using logic, not randomness. It was great. I think it's hard for a computer to actually do that without the intuition. Well, I thought, well, would you call that intuition or just plain logic? I, I don't know. But well you. done. Well done. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of an educated, educated guess. Intuition, educated guess. I'm not sure where one starts and one begins, but I think that's what you did. And you're the first student actually to have done that. Pretty cool. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. See you soon, everybody. Bye.